Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. And I'm Viano Ravinka. President Obama gave himself a grade of B plus for his first year in office in an interview with Oprah Winfrey. But how Americans rate the president varies widely according to race. Polls show his approval ratings slipping among whites, but remaining high in communities of color, especially among African Americans. But do polls tell the entire story? On this edition of Independent Sources, we, we sit down with two veteran black journalists to get an assessment of Barack Obama in the black community. We look at nonprofits as a business model for news. And we profile African newspaper publisher and radio personality Chika Oniani. We'll bring you these stories and more after this. Ethnic media is important because it's a bridge between ethnic communities and the larger American community. Recent polls report a dramatic split in how Americans view Barack Obama. His approval rating among blacks is almost double that among whites, 90% to 47%. But the president is facing increasing criticism in some quarters of black society, also from columnists to Congress to community activists. So where does he really stand among blacks? To try to get a read on the Obama barometer, I'm joined by journalist and author of the recently published book Simeon Story, Herb Boyd, and by Smokey Fontaine of the website newsone.com. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we see these poll numbers, but are they a reflection of how black Americans really think about President Obama? Smokey, what kind of feedback have you been getting from people online? What are they saying? Well, it's interesting for us. We have a news site called newsone.com, which is connected to the largest African-American social network, Black Planet. So we have an extraordinary position where we can poll our members con on a constant basis to really get the pulse of what the community is thinking. We launched News One about 18 months ago, so we've almost had the existence of the same time period that Obama's been in office. 18 months ago, his approval rating was 97%. Over the, over the early part of the year, it was in the 80, high 80 percentile. We did a poll last week right after he announced that he was sending 30,000 troops to Afghanistan. His poll rating dipped to 76 percent. That's the lowest we've seen in many months since the beginning of his, pre of his presidency. That's not to say that 76 percent is low approval, mm -hmm. but it certainly is beginning to show that there are some, some cracks in, in his support, and I think for good reason. African-Americans are not going to allow him to make decisions that they don't feel represent them just because he's black. Mm -hmm. And Herb, what's your assessment of how the community feels at this point in time? Well, when you, when you come to polls, you know, it's always like a relative thing. It's just a snapshot of a moment. And uh, all we have to do is look at the recent mayoral elections here in New York City to say that, well, you can throw the polls right out of the window. They don't mean anything at all. But I think these are signif very significant developments here to show that there's something happening out there, something is going on. And it's been going on quite a while. I mean, and, and it's a mounting concern coming from the African-American community. Uh, we realized early on that he did not have, uh, he could not have our interests as, as, a special, as a special feature of his campaign. He backed off saying or talking, discussing anything at all about race. He could not play the race card. And I think the whole Jeremiah Wright incident kind of spelled that out and gave it a kind of dramatic intensity. And then right on down to uh, looking at the situations with, uh, with Van Jones, who uh, a number of African Americans who've been close, who've been thrown under the bus more or less. And so there's been some concern from even the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus now, is raising some concerns about the whole issue of joblessness. And he's not addressing the very specific in very dire circumstances in the African American community where those numbers show that what is if, if it's 10 percent you know for the general population we can recognize that it's almost triple or quadruple when you look at the African American community so they want the concern now and coming from the National Urban League Mark Moriel is also he wrote a letter to uh, you know address a letter to the administration saying something has to be done mm -hmm. he has to address the very special needs of the African American community 
And is it a friction that we see between black leaders and President Obama, or is it like the NAACP is saying, and as President himself recently said, that he is expecting this pressure, he wants this pressure from the black community? What do you think? Well, I don't, I don't think he wants the pressure, but, but there's certainly no friction. Um, you know, this is the normal course of politics for constituent groups to raise a hand and say, we need help and we need your special attention. I mean, what the CBC did to, to call a special meeting with Rahm Emanuel and to get on the president's agenda was very justified. They said, look, as, as you say, mm -hmm. our rate of joblessness is much higher than, than, you know, than the national averages. Our rate of poverty is much higher. And so we're being hurt by this recession more than any other. Obama, however, did speak to race when he was asked directly uh, last week. He said that he will super serve the needs of African Americans by serving all Americans. And, you know, that was a statement that many of us may agree with, but it was somewhat of an unfortunate statement to make in light of all these recent developments because it seems to say that you are not going to even give a nod to the special needs that we have, even if it's we're going to benefit from your larger agenda. Mm -hmm. And Herb, you've been traveling with the president. Can you give us a sense of what he thinks the community expects from him? Well, I think uh, we, re we realized even during the election he had, he had no special interests in the African-American community. Uh, he took us for granted that you know the vote would be our would be his. We'd have to worry about that at all. His concern was to get the white vote, and many people feel that if the black vote had stayed home, he still you know I mean he he would have won the election. Uh, when you consider that we're only thirteen percent of the population, thirty percent of the overall vote there, he got what sixty nine thousand sixty nine million votes that we may have put uh, something like seven to eight million votes out there. I think it was like a nine million vote difference, you know, mm -hmm. in the election. So it's, it's some, some validity to that. But at the same time, we're concerned about the fact that um, if, if the African-American community, and I'm certain that some people feel that the vote was a very significant, significant difference in some parts of the community, uh, in some states in particular, it brought home the vote for him. Uh, but nonetheless, he people say, hey, I didn't have any, I didn't offer you any special plan, and we didn't expect any. So it's a concern now about uh, pushing back against him because it begins to say something about our own judgment in supporting him. Is it, were we wrong, you know, to push you out there? Is he begin to step away from some of the issues, some of the primary campaign promises that he made. Certainly the uh, escalation of the military situation in mm -hmm. Afghanistan is like backing up on a particular campaign promise that he made to say nothing about, well, affirmative action. He never, he, he kind of stepped aside. He didn't want to deal with that. Uh, when it came to uh, the whole immigration policy, some of these things were put on the uh, back burner while he pushed his universal health care reform almost obsessively. So that's been his concern now, and it's that kind of a general thing, you know, as, as Smokey points out. He says, hey, I'm, I'm offering this here for all of the population. There's no special ethnicity that mm -hmm. I'm going to be programming. There's no special interest group out there. I'm talking about it's a general program. I am the president of America, not Afro-America. And, and, and I think he kind of, it's, it's a line that he has to walk carefully, right? Because he clearly is the president of all America. Mm -hmm. But there would, it would be nice if there were times where we would feel comfortable that our needs are being addressed in, in much more of a, a specific way, right? I mean, we can, universal health care is definitely going to benefit the African-American community, mm -hmm. as, is, as is the decision to go to war, not to go to war, is going to have profound effects on the African-American community and African-American families because we make up the majority of the military. So. I don't doubt that President Obama gets it, right? I mean, we know that he is there to represent us. He's going to represent us in the best way possible. I think he has to toe the line at times mm -hmm. um, to make sure that he does not seem to the rest of his constituents that he's play paying any special service. And I think we should do more of what the Congressional Black Caucus did. We spoke to, I spoke to, you know, Congresswoman Waters and Lee about, about what they actually said to him. They said, look, we don't want special treatment. We just need to know that you know that we're suffering. Mm -hmm. And we're suffering more than anybody else. And I think he did get that message. Um, and let's hope he passes health care because that will benefit us. We inordinately do not have health insurance and what we need, especially for our young children. Mm -hmm. And let's make sure he makes the right steps um, in, in to re create jobs. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for <laughs> today. But I'm sure we'll follow up in the future. Mm -hmm. Herb Boyd and Smokey Fontaine, thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much.
Now, here's Aisha Al-Muslim with some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From El Diario La Prensa, experts from the University of California at San Diego have designed an application that uses the global positioning system to help Mexicans cross the border into the U.S. Professors at the university who designed the application say the objective is to direct those who approach dangerous areas as they attempt to flee their country. The GPS system will indicate where there are places with water and give them the ability to press an emergency button if they need help. Also from El Diario La Prensa, one of the little-known threats to the Latino community is the high rate of suicide and attempted suicide among Hispanic female teenagers. Hispanic teenage girls are the most likely to consider or carry out suicide compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Young Latinas have an attempted suicide rate of 15%. White female teens have a rate of 9%, and black female teens have a rate of 10%. The high rate among Latinas has been linked to immigration and their families' experience adapting to a new country. The Forward reports that Neil Grungras, former executive of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, will help gay and transgender people who have escaped oppression throughout the world. Grungras Group, the Organization for Refugee, Asylum and Migration, will launch a global survey in January about attitudes towards lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender migrants. According to Grungras, 85 countries criminalize homosexual behavior, with seven applying the death penalty. And finally, Caribbean Life reports that Barbados graduates more black high school students than the United States. Nearly 100 percent of students from the tiny Caribbean island graduate, and over 50 percent go to college. This while less than 50 percent of African American students graduate from high school. Barbados has the second highest literacy rate in the world and invests nearly a fifth of its national budget into education. Those are just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to you, Gary. With more and more publications cutting back or shutting down, the news industry is experimenting with new ways to survive. Hyperlocal as well as collaborative efforts are part of the new trend in coverage. Ownership by nonprofit organizations is being explored as an alternative business model. With me to discuss nonprofits and the news industry is Walter Fields, publisher of City Limits. Also joining me is independent magazine editor Abby Sher. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get into the discussion, let's look at this report by Michelle Garcia on a new news model in the Bronx. When you come to these meetings, you see the same people. They really care. They've been here for 30 years. I'm Rachel Waltz, and I'm uh, the only reporter for the Tremont Tribune, and so I'm here covering the community board meeting. For example, the MTA, they, they Take one reporter in the South Bronx and another in the Kingsbridge section, papers in Mott Haven and Hunts Point, and you have the Bronx News Network, a collaboration of not-for-profit community newspapers. And everyone from these papers can and does post to the blog. Then we have feeds from other Bronx blogs here on RSS feeds. Occasionally we have video on the blog as well. A daily news article about cuts to a homeless prevention program only told you part of the story. The Norwood News, with the backing of their nonprofit patron, Moshulu Preservation Corporation, searched for partner papers like the Hunts Point Express and even pollinated a few new ones, including the Tremont Tribune. There are most Bronx and neighborhoods have no um, spotlight on its, like, you know, uh, um, civic, you know, stage. In the run-up to the city council's decision on the fate of the massive abandoned armory, a critical public space issue for the Kingsbridge community, the Bronx News Network became an outlet for informing other Bronx neighborhoods about the looming real estate issue and the jobs at stake for borough residents. This, we've posted, this is about the Kingsbridge Ar Armory, and we've posted this right before the he hearing. It's sort of like an overview and what to expect. And uh, actually, um, I know that folks read it because I got an earful from some of, some, some of the folks I were, were, were working on this that they didn't agree with something that I said. Um, and that's great. That, that's what we want. We want folks to care about it and read it every day. Full disclosure, two of the newspapers for the Bronx News Network are produced by CUNY students. 
what the Bronx News Network is doing, where they're sharing resources, where they have you know one back-end office that all the different newspapers operate out of. They share their content with each other. That's exactly what's happening um, in the leading investigative journalism projects in the country right now. The NPR and the Center for uh, Investigative Journalism, they're trying to figure out that model for themselves. Still, for all the similarities, there's a big difference between the Bronx News Network and large news organizations. Communities who haven't been covered are able to bring uh, their own voice to counter uh, images of their community in the media or l lack of those images. I don't think that um, news organizations, they haven't learned the lesson about really deeply reflecting on perhaps the populations that they haven't been covering because they haven't had to learn it. But it's a big challenge for networks, big and small, to make their collaborations financially viable. It's not economical to do it unless you have a very large network, meaning that you've aggregated thousands and thousands of sites and you can link them all together and deliver relevant ads. And there's another issue the sometimes uneasy marriage between news outlets and their nonprofit funders. Moss says a critical housing story that appeared in the Mount Hope Monitor provoked criticism from its sponsor, the Mount Hope Housing Company. It's not, not an issue. Um, it's something to, con to constantly be vigilant about. But it's always hard. I mean, I, I mean anyone that says that it's not hard is not tell telling you the truth. The final arbiter, though, of nonprofit and collaborative experiments is the community that decides with its eyeballs how well it works for them. For Independent Sources, I'm Michelle Garcia. Walter, let's start with you. You just recently bought the City Limits. City Limits is interesting in the sense that it's, it was founded as a nonprofit. Still, it has had some of its share of problems. Uh, where do you want to take it? Well, I think the first thing you want to do is more of what we've always done, being a solid investigative journalism magazine and website and increase the frequency of our reporting. You know, we're going to remain a not-for-profit organization. It was purchased by the Community Service Society, one of the New York City's oldest not-for-profits and one of the nation's uh, not-for-profits of standing in issues of poverty. But I think for City Limits, it's a real opportunity. Uh, despite the unease today uh, in news media, I think it's a very exciting time. I think we have an opportunity to experiment and to explore and to try to find the right business model for this magazine and website, and that's what we work towards every day. Okay. Um, for instance, you said you're going to change the frequency. Uh, what is it now? And It's, what, it's, it's currently a quarterly magazine. At one time it was actually a, a monthly, but now we're going to go to a bi-monthly publication schedule, so the frequency will change. The look of it will change. To what? Uh, Bi-monthly, every two months. Okay. Um, the look of it will change. I think people will be very surprised when they see our first edition roll off the print next year. It will be a much different looking city limit. And we're also reinvigorating our website to coordinate it better with the magazine. So part of it is look and feel, but part of it is digging deeper in stories uh, and subjects that we've always covered, but now having more resources to do that. Okay. Abby, you've worked in nonprofit your entire <laughs> professional career. Uh, you've, ran, you've worked at nonprofit magazines just recently now up in Boston. Uh, can nonprofit work? Can that model work? Well, I'm very interested to hear uh, that you want to invigorate the, um, the resources of City Limits, having written for City Limits back in the 90s. Um, um, it's always been strapped, and the nonprofit model is, as Jordan Moss said in your segment, is very challenging. Um, I work for a nonprofit uh, think tank right now that tracks the American right wing. Um, I'm just leaving there uh, as editor of their quarterly. And um, um, experts on the right wing, but our lawyer told us during the election year we couldn't really cover the election because the very focus, our very focus on the right meant that we were partisan. Um, so even though we had great information about various candidates, we had to basically shut down part of our news operation in the area where we were most vitally needed. And um, the, the um, challenge of nonprofit publishing in an increasingly partisan media environment is that you're gagged. Um, 
on certain issues at certain moments. Um, Speaking of that, Walter, this is one of the uh, criticism of this model. For instance, even in, uh, in, in Michelle Garcia's piece, uh, the Bronx News Network had a conflict with the Moshula Corporation, which owns the, the newspapers. Uh, is, this, is this model a PR tool for these organizations? Not necessarily. Uh, the Community Service Society made a commitment that it would operate city limits as an independent news organization. In fact, come July 1st, it'll be spun off separately and will have its own board. Uh, the funding has been provided by the Community Service Society and we're seeking foundation support. I think the only way this model really works is a combination of earned income, advertising revenue, and they're going to have to be subsidized. I don't think any of these um, entities will, will exist amongst themselves simply by advertising revenue. It's not going to happen. You really have to be subsidized and that's the model we're working with. I think our intention is to run um, an organization that may at the end of the year uh, break even or have a small fund balance as a not-for-profit, but I don't think we're fooling ourselves thinking that we are going to run sort of a major news organization in the old model. The old model is dead and that's why newspapers are dying on the vine. I think not-for-profits have to find a clever combination of advertising revenue, uh, subsidies, as well as maybe some e-commerce also that will allow them to survive. Okay. Is there a conflict of interest inherent in this model as well? Yes. I'm, as, as Jordan said, anyone who says there's not, I mean, probably hasn't been vigorous enough in their reporting in a certain in a certain area and um, um, I, I mean I also realize that y you may not necessarily have a lot of choice that you might need a organization as powerful as a community service society for city limits to survive that city limits would require um, uh, an institution with your foundation connections to to sustain it and infrastructure because one of the challenges of nonprofit publishing is um, usually they're just a single publication. You're extremely taxed with your staffing. Um, and uh, another thing that's happening in nonprofit magazine publishing right now is um, the loss of subscription revenue because of the web. So they have their own version of the collapse that's going on in the mainstream media. You're having subscription collapse where you, a, a reliable revenue source used to be um, paid subscriptions for your magazine and you would borrow $100,000 for a direct mail campaign. You'd bring in subscribers and um, those subscribers would pay, pay back over time with donations and subscription revenue. And that is no longer really operating because people uh, who are readers of the nonprofit press are going to the web. Um, so you need even more, none of the, no nonprofit uh, magazine probably survives without some foundation support. Although I worked for one um, dollars and cents that continues to exist because it um, publishes economics readers that are used in college classrooms. Um, so public mm -hmm. policy readers mm -hmm. coming out of city limits that can be used in public policy schools. Mm -hmm. um, well, Walter, I'd like to pick up on a point that Abby uh, mentioned earlier about the challenge of having one title publication and how, how, how difficult that is. With city limits, you know, how do you gonna generate money? Do you have a plan to generate money through a subscription? We currently do, and we currently get advertising. We currently get classified advertising. The question is, how far can you go in building the enterprise with what you current, your current revenue stream? I think what's, what's important to remember here is that we're no longer looking at City Limits as a magazine and a website. City Limits is a content platform. So the old model of this wall between the two, you have to abolish. I think that's what we're seeing in you know, the, the for-profit media, that you're beginning to more think about a content platform where you can provide content, sell it perhaps online. That's a new model that people are still looking at, whether or not people will ever pay for online uh, content. Wall Street Journal does, but they have a very defined audience, uh, most of which is subsidized by their companies for subscriptions to the Wall Street Journal. But I think what we're in is a period of extreme experimentation to find out which model actually works. And those conflicts are inherent across platforms. So even in so-called mainstream media, you know, if you look at GE owning NBC, those conflicts are always there. There's no such thing as pure journalism. Uh, what we have in the not-for-profit side, though, is the bigger challenge in that you're not revenue-driven in the fact that you don't have the same ability as a New York Times or a Daily News to drive revenue. 
But I do think that there is a place for not-for-profit media. And so when we look across the country, whether it's Christian Science Monitor, there are some examples out there of people struggling to try to find the correct model. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and we have to leave it at that. Abby Sher and Walter Fields, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be right back. Chika Onyani has had a long and varied career in journalism. He's a newspaper publisher, radio personality, and author. Adeola Oladele talked with a Nigerian newsman about coverage of African countries and communities in the U.S. African Enquirer was established in 1978. It was modeled after the old National Enquirer. At that time, there was no no newspaper that was uh, geared towards the African community. There are many things that we cover that the mainstream media, they don't even, they don't even know is happening in our community. After two years of experimenting with different names, in 1980, the African Enquirer changed to the African Sun-Times. It covered stories from various African countries, as well as from African communities here in the U.S. So what kind of feedbacks are you getting from people? As the owner, I would say positive. <laughs> of course, uh, there, there, are, there are people who uh, sometimes are not happy with uh, some of the things uh, we, we write. The 66-year-old says living outside his country gives him freedom to write about African controversial issues. If I was uh, in Nigeria or Gambia, I might be in jail already. Onyani is originally from Nigeria. In 2005, he started hosting a weekly show on All Africa Radio, where he discusses African controversial issues. This is Straight Talk with Chika Onyani on the All Africa Radio, Sunu Afrique. We try to fight the kind of uh, information that uh, is uh, portrayed about Africa, which is always negative. Since the two-hour show began on Friday nights, it has empowered African communities in the ethnic media. The African community, we have come of age. We have over uh, 600,000 Africans in the metropolitan area. After 9-11, Onyani moved African sometimes from downtown Manhattan to his home in New Jersey. Uh, so we moved there, and now, because of, uh, of the downtown, uh, people are saying they can't advertise as well. He likens the recent economic downturn to his experience in 2001. You know, people started saying, oh, we are contributing to 9-11 victims, so we can't advertise. Not only that, the paper is being challenged by digital convergence, like other newspapers. Despite these challenges, he's encouraged by the positive feedback he gets from the readers. Now, he's thinking of adding multimedia components to the paper's website. For independent sources, I'm Adiola Oladili. That's our show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. In the meantime, be independent-minded. <laughs>